How's everybody? Good, good. Me too. Me too. Um, we're on a journey through First John as, um, as, as Frank already prayed, and some people uh, might not realize that there's a couple of other books that he's uh, supposedly written in the New Testament. So he wrote five books. He wrote uh, the Gospel of John and uh, First, Second, and Third John, and and uh, and Revelation. And 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 this book is about this book of First John chapter First John. We happen to be in chapter three today. Is 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 really about this idea of being a believer. Uh, it's, it's confirming our faith as a believer. It's uh, it's confirming our trust in Jesus Christ for our salvation. And also for getting us into the life of a believer. Um, and the problem is, is that during these days, there was a, a number of false teachers around. There were a number of people that were uh, claiming to have certain levels of authority that were, that were uh, blindsiding believers. And so, uh, so, so this happened. And, and I want you to know that uh, if, if you've ever, uh, anybody ever held a, a dollar bill or five dollar bill or ten dollar bill that was that was that was uh, counterfeit. Congratulations. Um, I've had that opportunity as well, and and um, I have a friend who was a bank teller, and they and they told me why it was counterfeit. And and nowadays we have all these mechanisms that uh, make those decisions for us. You know, anything that's a twenty dollar bill, they. For a while, they were rubbing them with a pen, and, and uh, you didn't know whether it was supposed to be black or whether it was supposed to be brown or whether it was supposed to be a mark. And you're like, oh, is, is it real? Is it not? And, and uh, then they started to have these little sleeves, these little blue sleeves or purple sleeves down them. And um, then they made the fibers that are in there a little bit easier to see. And the truth is they didn't want people, they didn't want people being tricked. Um, you know, and, and uh, b- because they want people to know what's real. And so bank tellers spent all of their time feeling and touching what was real so that they would know what is fake. Okay? So, so I'm going to do my best to get us into the mindset of, of 1 John 3 here, right? Uh, there's this game called Where's Waldo? Okay? How many of you, how many of you have ever played Where's Waldo? Do you know what people are doing now with Where's Waldo books? They're, they're, they're buying them and they're uh, photoshopping a couple of the pages and taking Waldo out. And then they're giving them to their grandkids. Is that fun or what? Because it doesn't even exist. But I want you to know that the fun of Where's Waldo really is you, you, you got to know what he looks like. And in case you didn't know, I'm going to help you know what, 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 what Waldo actually looks like, okay? So, um, because some, some people don't comprehend the fun that there might be. I, I, you, know, I, 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 you know, when I was growing up, there was always that comment of, where's John? Um, uh, you, you know, and what kind of mischief I might be up to. But if, but if you don't know, okay, maybe I should have bought a larger size, okay? Um, but uh, this is kind of what this is kind of what 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 Waldo looks like, okay? And and some of you might be saying, John, this is ridiculous. But here's the point: you know what he looks like. So is this is this what Waldo kind of looks like? How many of you are like you're a good Waldo, John? Okay. Now the, the point is, you have a picture of what he looks like, right? Okay. First John is giving us a picture of what the body of believers look like, but it's in text. It's not in a visual picture. And I, I, I so so I, I want you to, I want you to gather in your mind that what we're trying to do this morning is we're trying to gain a picture of insight as to what the body of believers is. We're going to give you a picture. I'll, 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 get this, I'll get the distraction out of the way. If nothing else, my wife probably thought it was, I was cute finally. So, uh. <laughs> Father God, give us insights from your word today. May, uh, may your word speak to us. Lord, help us to be the children of God that we want to be. 
We love you. Amen. John chapter 3, it starts out this way. It says, how great is the Father's love that has been lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it does not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for he, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Verse 4. Everyone who breaks the law, in fact, sin is lawlessness. But when you know that he hap- but 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 you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he also is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of Man, sorry, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning, because he has been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. This is the message you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This is how we know what the love of God is. Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, if we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask, because we obey his commands and do what pleases him, and this is his command to believe in the name of the Son of Jesus Christ, in his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. You know, one of the most important things about this chapter is is that we are called children of God. Would you say that? We are a child of God. You know what? That's, That's an incredible position to be in. Because without him as our heavenly father, you know who is? The devil. And, and, that, and that's, that's a bad thing. And, and, and yet we've been chosen to be adopted into his family. And true children of God re- reject skin. Sorry, my mouth is getting. I went for a walk this morning and my mouth is still kind of cold. Let me try that again. True children of God reject sin and are living examples of being loving people. You know, children usually reflect their parents. Um, 
I, I couldn't find any, but uh, um, if you saw pictures of my dad when he was in first grade and me, you might not be able to tell who's who. If you saw pictures of me in high school and you saw pictures of him in high school, the only difference is that they all wore ties in those days, long time ago, and, and, and we didn't. People tell me often, they go, hey, is your last name Hathorne? I said, yeah. He said, I know Bill Hathorne. And then I said, yeah, that's my dad. Well, I knew it was your dad because you looked just like him. And this, has gone on, this has gone on my whole life. And it paid a lot of dividends until one day. I'll just stop there. <laughs> but you know what? We are a reflection of the Heavenly Father. We're a reflection of Him. And probably the most, probably the most key verse... There's a lot of key verses, but probably the most key verse is verse 10 where it says, this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. Now, now some of you are thinking, but I blew it yesterday. I blew it on my way here this morning. You know what? There's a difference between... I live in that all the time, and that bothered me, and I went back to correction. There's a huge difference. Think about a guy like Moses. He lost his temper, and he disobeyed God. Peter denied the Lord three times. Jonah ran from God. The scriptures are full of people who give you and I hope when we think, what if we blow it? Yes, these people made mistakes, and we do as well. A guy named Warren Wiersbe put it this way. There's a difference between an incident which is contrary to their normal habits. I love that thought. When they sinned, they admitted it, and they asked for forgiveness, and they began to move on. It's not where we've been that's important. It's where our heart is going. It's where our actions are going. That's the key thing there. So, so how do we become a child of God? We become a child of God because of the extravagant love of the Father, which is spoken of in these first couple of verses. He lavished love upon us. He showered us and outpoured love on us. He put an overwhelming amount. Imagine being, I saw this happen, okay? I saw a guy grab what looked like a five-gallon jug of a uh, f- five gallon uh, bucket you know those paint buckets okay and uh, he had a boy sit down and he goes I want to show you about the lavishing love of Jesus okay but it wasn't five gallons it was 10 gallons and he just started to pour it on him imagine how long it takes a steady stream of water with five g- gallons of water just shh come on do it with me shh It lasted for 90 seconds. We thought it was done at 10. We thought it was done at 15. We thought it was done. That's the overwhelming lavishness of God's love being poured out on us. It's not a sprinkle. It's not a squirt gun. I'm done. It just keeps going and going. It's a lifestyle of love that he had. And it's a lifestyle of love that that we are to have. And you know what? The world doesn't recognize that. Nowadays, the world recognizes those who are most sarcastic. Nowadays, it's, it's, it's the one who's most funny. It's the one who's most crude. He didn't just save us from going to hell. He adopted us so that we would be his children and so that we would be an imitation of him. The world doesn't know God, and therefore, it's not going to necessarily always know us and appreciate us. A second thought about his love extravaganza is this, is that, is that we are to be imitators of that. When he appears, we will be like him. Uh, we're residents of heaven. We're not residents of earth, okay? And, and we will literally be a reflection of him. When people see us, they're going to see the love of Jesus Christ. They're going to see a love of the Father. That is an incredible appetizing thing that people want to be a part of. They don't always want to admit it, but it is something that they want. It's actually something that they desire. And and the truth is, is that this love, we're in the process of being purified by this love, okay? Um, 
our, our eternal destiny is an incredible hope of what we are going to be purified to become. We're to become more like him. As it says in Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. How can you and I do good works if we're not connected to the one who is good? Make sense? Otherwise, otherwise, you know what? It's a self-serving thing for a raise. It's a self-serving thing for a pat on the back. It's a self-serving thing for a better seat. It's a self-serving thing for a, a, a compliment. And, and, in, and in Philippians 1, 6, it says, it says, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you, he's going to purify it until the day of Christ. It's, it, it's just going to be in process. Um, I had a chance to watch swords being made one time. Incredible. Anybody ever watched metal get beat? What happens when you beat metal? Sparks fly. Isn't that, isn't, aren't sparks flying just fun? Aren't they? If you got glasses on, they're really fun. And, and, and this guy's making this sword. I said, what are you doing? He goes, I'm making a sword. He's just hitting this metal. And sparks are flying. After a while, I said, hey, can I, can I ask you a question? I said, there's less sparks flying now than there was before. He says, that's because the impurities are leaving with every spark that flies. What's pure stays connected. What's impure gets knocked out. When you and I have a rough day, thank God for the purification. Can we say that? Thank God for the purification. Not to be embarrassed, but to say, dear God, I always wanted to be looking like you. I wanted to be looking like you. And, and, and yet... Is it a little bit embarrassing sometimes? Certainly, because we, we, we'd like to appear better than we are. At least, that's my problem. Um, so so the, the, the second part of this chapter, which is virtually almost the whole thing, is really about what I call the vital signs of a believer or the vital signs of a church. Um, most of you here have probably been to the doctor or you've been to the emergency room as a patient, or you've seen somebody go to the emergency room and they do this. They say, hey, let's take his vital signs. What are the vital signs? See what kind of temperature the guy's running. What kind of temperature the lady's running. Let's see what kind of pulse they have. Or do they have a pulse? What, what, kind, of, uh, what kind of blood pressure do they have? Okay? And, 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 the, whole I, and the whole idea is, and, and nowadays they check your oxygen level. And, 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 and the point is, is that as you get these things done, they're saying, hey, is there something major out of whack? I don't necessarily understand all of those things, okay? But I know what's healthy, okay? And every time I go to the doctor, I might as well just tell my wife before she asks. She's a nurse, and it's like, hey, my blood pressure was, and then I tell her what it was, okay? Why? Because those vital signs are important. But they're not just important physically, they're important spiritually. And, and here's, here's, a little bit of a, here's a little bit of check for us. We're going to do a little checkup here on ourselves this morning. Not to beat ourselves up, but to say, do I have a little impurity that needs to get knocked out? Okay? Here's the first one. In verse 4, it says this. We have an appetite for doing right. There's more right thinking taking place in our mind than wrong thinking, okay? A child of God is somebody who desires to serve God and honor him much more than anything else. In verse 5, it goes on to say this, sin bothers us. Sin should bother us. I want you to know that, that quite frankly, uh, if, if I go play basketball with a bunch of guys that are non-believers and some guy swears and then he apologizes for my sake, I usually say, don't be sorry for me, be sorry for you and God. And then they get their attention. They go, what? I said, hey, I said, hey, hey, it doesn't bother, hey, it, 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 it doesn't bother me that you talk like that because that's who you are, okay? And, and, and I'm backing up at this time because I think the guy might be beating the credit. I'm, and I usually say, you know what, you offended God, not me. If me having skin on and being here helps be a reminder of that, then praise God. But I just want you to know, tell him you're sorry, not me. And usually they're like, and then I'm, they're, they're looking for Waldo at that point, okay? Um, but sin should bother us. Uh, sin is lawlessness. Sin is an abomination to God. We don't live in continual sin. We have an at, we had an attitude of, of serving God and of bringing God glory. It doesn't mean that we're perfect, 
Sure, we're going to make mistakes, but as I said earlier, that should hurt our hearts a little bit. That should hurt our head a little bit because we have hurt the heart of God as we fall into those situations. Uh, a, a, third, a third comment about some vital signs are, is, is that we would love one another. I want to I tell you that I think this is one of the most, um, most loving churches I've ever been in my life. I mean this honestly. I, if somebody ever came here and told me that they didn't get greeted, I'd say, you're talking about another church. Just, I think you're just, we're just really good at that. I think that some of us have been together so long here at the church that, that, um, that you know, we have our place to sit. And we don't know if it's okay. Can I bring that person here and sit and take their spot? Okay. Uh, I'm going to tell you a true story. This, my first Sunday here was seven years ago this week. I came to both services. Pamela, would you just wave your hand? That's where I sat, right there. And a guy named Mark Gant came up to me and he said, uh, Pastor Fred t told him who I was. He came up and said hi. And I said, I said, hi, hi. And he goes, would you, just, would you just sit right back down here? He goes, because that's where so-and-so sits. And he wouldn't say my name. He goes, and I want to see what their reaction is. <laughs> so I'm looking around the whole time going, I'd like to see this too. I went to the second service because they were a little bit different, and I, and I sat over. I, 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 I sat over here. Okay, Phil, would you just raise your hand and wave? That's where I sat in the second. And Mark comes over to me again, and he says, "Stay here. I want to see this reaction too." And and, and the point is this: is that is that. Um, Mark was having a little fun there that morning. He kind of wanted to see. And that's part of love. Love isn't always 100% not making mistakes. It's enjoying one another. It's 50 times in the scripture talks about the one another verses. There are people who I'm friends with. And if, I, and, and, and if we don't share some funny picture back and forth, they'll think I don't love them anymore. Because it's just kind of the way our relationship is. It's not all, it's not all perfection. It's enjoying one another. Uh, the, the passage goes on after speaking about those things in verse 13. And it says, we probably will be hated by the world. You know what? The world doesn't love the fact that our church hosted a, uh, hosted a movie about 1916. Okay. In fact, I asked, some, I asked the organization, I said, hey, is there any way we might get protested against that day? He goes, maybe. I said, really? And, 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 and so I'm sharing this with some of them. They said, what are you going to do? I said, smile and wave and go say hi to them. Because that's who we are. That's who we're supposed to be. I had a friend recently say this to me. John, I was wondering if I was any, doing anything right for the Lord and speaking up for him because I have not been persecuted recently. If I'm going to stand up for the Lord, I might not be loved by everyone. And, and, and another part here is that it says our heart is demonstrated by our actions. Okay? Um, you know, our actions, of, our actions of love show who God is. Our actions of, of, of hatred show that we're out of sync with God for a moment, okay? Um, here's the tricky part. Um, there's humanitarian efforts all over the world. And that's fabulous. But those humanitarian efforts helping these people understand who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And is it helping point them to a personal relationship with him? Or is it just taking care of a temporary problem? You see, when Jesus left the earth, there were still a lot of people that were sick. There were still a lot of people that were needing to be fed. There was still a lot of people that had uh, homelessness problems. Because Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. His number one reason for coming was not to feed the world food. Is feeding the, feeding the people of the world food a good idea? Yes. Praise God for those organizations. But the truth is, is that we have, to, we have to demonstrate it in the love of Jesus Christ, in our actions and in our words. It's an important element. So how are the children of God supposed to live? Um, I'm going to detour from this passage for a second, and I'm going to go to a what I call the greatest example in the world that's in the scriptures about uh, the children of God in Acts chapter 2, okay? Um, 
because really the rest of this, the rest of this passage is, is simply about our relationship with God, about having confidence in speaking with God and having confidence in abiding with God and sharing our possessions and laying down our lives. And, and I thought that one of the greatest things we could do is just walk through Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, which is, which is an example that the believers had in the early church. Let me read it to you. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and the goods. They gave to everyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet people in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. In your bulletin are these 10 markers, these 10 statements that really are the 10 things that are spoken of here, the vital signs, the where's Waldo, where's, where's the love of Jesus Christ? Where is the love of the Father? Where is the example of the child? Where are the children of God? It, it, this, is, this is them right here. Biblical teaching. I would do this. I promise you I would do this. If we ever had a guest speaker and they were off base, I have no problem interrupting them. Why? It's going to be the most awkward moment in the world, but I'm going to stand before God for allowing that to happen. Jesus said to teach them everything we have commanded you. And so the apostles did that. The centrality and the supremacy and the authority of God's word has got to be the central thing shared amongst body and believers. The second thing is fellowship and quantity and in quality. The word koinonia, there's many, many churches have a room called koinonia hall or koinonia room. And all that means is it's the fellowship room. It's, it's the room where, uh, uh, it's, the, it's the room of uniting hearts and minds together. And, and, and that needs to take place. Uh, number three is the idea of breaking bread together. The focus of fellowship was the Lord's Supper, where they reminded each other of the death and the resurrection of Christ. And, and the truth is, without the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is no such thing as Christianity. It's called something else. Steadfast prayer was a part of their life. I want you to know that I am thrilled every week Every week, our, our office manager, it was, it, was, uh, it was Cheryl for a while, and then it was Don, and now it's Megan. They type up, the, they, they type up the, the, the prayer requests that are shared, and they share that with our elders. They share it with some people on our prayer chain. What a privilege to pray for the body of Christ. What a privilege. If you'd like to be a part of that, just send a note to Megan in the office, and she will make sure that you're somebody who does. Prayer was the first resource, not the last resort. Can you say that with me? Prayer was the first resource, not the last resort. There was an awe and a fear of God that took place here. They were naturally supernatural thinking. What can God do here? Not what can I do. What can God do? What can God do through me? The power and the presence of God was manifest regularly. You know how cool it would have been to be in Acts chapter 3 where you, you got to the temple and this guy, um, you know, uh, this guy's crippled there, and, and two of the apostles walk up, and they, and he says to them, silver and gold have I none. Just think if they would have had some money. We would have missed a miracle. We would have missed a miracle. And why is that important? Because the miracle was done by the Lord through these people. They were regularly seeing the work of God take place. The presence and the power of the manifested God of the universe is what they expected to see work. And I hope that you and I will be people of prayer and faith in Almighty God and that we would trust him for a miracle. And if he says no, good. Because our attitude said, we want what you want. This, how are we doing so far? Good. We're, we're halfway there. There was real community there. There was not what I call a, a, a position of ownership. You ever been with somebody and they say, that's mine. That's mine. That's mine. That's, that, hey, it's, it's ours. 
You know, in the Western world, we think much more individually than we do collectively. In, in other parts of the world, the idea of the community of God is much more understood because they share things regularly. I just heard this this week. This is a great phrase. Um, if you came to my house, I hope you feel free to have refrigerator rights. You know what refrigerator rights are? Okay. Bill, you know what refrigerator rights are? Yeah. I hope you would feel free to say, hey, John, could, hey, hey, John, could I have, could I have a, a, a cup of water? You might have to get through the breadcrumbs, okay? Um, because maybe I drank out of the, no, not, I, I don't do that, okay? <laughs> Bev would kill me if I did that. But, you know, I just heard this phrase this week called refrigerator rights. It says, you know you're friends with somebody when your refrigerator rights are, are, are in place. When Bev and I were uh, first married, her mom used to bake cookies every week, sometimes two batches. And I'll never forget the day I'd, we'd probably been married for about 18 months or so, and she told me, she goes, John, she goes, you don't have to ever ask me again if you want cookies. You just go get them. And I said the most awesome thing after that. Awesome is the wrong word there. I said, how many can I have? <laughs> and she said, as many as you want. And she said, and if they're stale, let me know, and I'll make you some fresh ones. <sighs> Matilda Burkle, she was the, one of the greatest bakers in the world. And um, I just got, okay, I just got to add this part to the story. I have a brother-in-law, Bev's sister's name is uh, Laura, and Laura's husband's name is John also. So I told John, Hey, why don't you go ask, ask mom if she'll, uh, if you can have cookies anytime you want. I set him up for this, okay, this whole thing. And she, he said, um, hey, I was wondering if I could just have cookies anytime I want. And she said, no. <laughs> and she goes, but you can ask John if you can have them and he'll tell you. <laughs> you know, that, 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 that really, that, that really focusing on the idea of community and, and, and just the importance of feeling like you're a part of the group. The seventh thing is an outpouring of generosity. It's a radical attitude towards our possessions are not our own. It's outrageous and extravagant and impractical and dangerous, but it's a real thing to do. Um, you know, personal possessions need to be seen as kingdom resources. Um, you know, I love it when somebody who... Uh, has a pool, says to a church youth group, hey, if you ever want to have a swim party, you come over. You know what? That's just meaning that the, that, that the pool is for the kingdom of God. And you can use the bathrooms too. That's, that adds to the excitement of it. But we live in a world obsessed with owning, we, of, of, of getting. And the church, the church here was committed to giving, not only, not only obediently, but sacrificially. You see, the obedient part of giving is the tithe. Then there's a sacrifice. Many people in this room made major sacrifices for the building of a building. Many here give once a month on the first Sunday of the month to something called the Deacon's Fund. That's, that, that's, that's really an offering. It's, just, it's, it's a little bit of a contribution to help something out. And we begin to realize that a guy asked me once uh, in, in the presence of another guy, he said, uh, Johnny says, how much am I supposed to give? And before I said anything, the other guy said, well, a tithe is the place to start. Everything on top of that is from your heart. He says, the first one's from your head. You got to do the math. Move the decimal point. This is a true story. You know how you can tell a, um, a, a tither in the Southern Baptist Church? This is not a joke. It's the truth, okay? Is they give in dollars, cents, and pennies. Because they just move the decimal point. That's how, they, that's how they tithe. They tithe exactly. And they say everything above that is an offering. Everything above that is a sacrifice. Truthfully, there was an outpouring of generosity that no one had needs. I want to say thank you for the giving to our deacon fund. Thank you for those of you who contributed towards the building. Thank you for those that are faithful givers here. May we continue this 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 principle. Here's the eighth one, is, is there was heartfelt hospitality. Um, we live in a depersonalized world. 
uh, the depersonalized world says, I'm going to open my garage door and go park inside and close it, and then I'm going to get out of my car so I don't have to meet any of my neighbors. Um, I'm going to wear earbuds so that nobody will talk to me. You ever walk through a mall and you don't want to talk to them? Just hold your phone up, okay? They, they won't interrupt you. Okay? But then it's really funny. Sometimes people will do that and then their phone rings. <laughs> The point is this, is that, you know what, I, I mean this, I mean this. Hospitality is not entertainment. As believers, we should get the word out of our head and out of our heart that says, I'm going to entertain some people. No, I'm going to be hospitable to them. You know what, pick up a chicken and divide it up into eight pieces. Just enjoy one of those cups. If you're having stew, just add two cups of water to it and thin it out, and it'll go another place or two. Invite somebody to go to Taco Bell Dutch Treat, or their treat, as a matter of fact. You know, really, we, we miss the opportunity to just have hospitality and the enjoyment of one another's personal thoughts. There's nothing wrong with inviting somebody to go to Taco Bell. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with inviting some. Hey, you want to go to Costco and get a hot dog today? For three bucks, you guys could both go there and a drink. And you could have hors d'oeuvres ahead of time inside. <laughs> and you know what? And you probably would have more fun just walking around and talking than you would if you sat down. Heartfelt hospitality simply says this. Hey, I love you and I want to spend a little bit of time with you. I want you to know you're loved. Genuine praise. There's something magnetic and attractive about a church that is celebrating in full joy and in thanks. And um, I, have, I have to tell you, I got my eyes open to something greatly. I asked somebody, I said, I said, does it surprise you when we clap in, at Lincoln and does it surprise you when we don't clap? And somebody said, John, some of us are older and we're like almost, we're almost clapping bone against bone because our fingers are wore out because we're a little bit older. And I said, I'm so glad they told me that. Anybody ever thought about that before? Any of you ever felt that before? I just want you to know that, that praise is, is magnetic and attractive to people. It's celebration. It's a sense of joy. Public worship is a great place for people to say, I want to be a part of that. And the last one is, is that spontaneous evangelism takes place. Our lives are so full of joy our lives are so full of the Spirit. Our lives are so full of a genuine praise and thanks to God that effective evangelism takes place because people say, what's going on? I want to be a part of that. Hey, hey you look like that didn't bother you too much. I'd like to, I'd, I'd like to know what you have that I don't. Um, quite frankly, all these are is where are the children of God? There are people who are expressing these 10 things. Uh, you know, the most exciting reality is this, is that the same Holy Spirit that birthed the early church is alive and well today, and it's birthing our church as well. I just want you to know, it's a privilege to be a part of the church here, and I hope that we will reflect these things in a very, very genuine way, because those are the vital signs of recognizing a church. Not where's Waldo, where's the church? Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the great joys and satisfactions that come from the word of God. We thank you for the confirmation of uh, the vital signs of the human body, and we thank you for the vital signs of the church. We thank you for the vital signs of our individual lives. We thank you for the opportunities that there are to express these things and that our heart would simply be, life's a little bit busy, but I want to take the time to do these things because those are important to me as well. Thank you for the sacrifices that take place to be your people. Thank you for the joy that we have by being around your people. Thank you for the people that are sitting next to people that they sit by every single week because those people bring them joy and satisfaction because of the community that they share. And we thank you for a new person who can, really they can't easily be a part of that same little group of people. We thank you for the big group of the church, and we thank you for those little groups, those Bible studies, those knitting groups, those 
quilting groups, the sports guys that are playing. We thank you for the Sunday school classes, the places that we can see what's alive and well in the church, that we might be the children of God together, and people would look to us and simply say, what you have is real. Thank you for expressing it. It's something that I need as well. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the chance to sing how worthy it is that you exist and how worthy we want our lives to be as the children of God. Amen.